true Constanza, and that's why we uh, uh, said for this panel that Constanza and the Black Sea could be a hub for Europe because we can understand and we can see that billions are coming from the Black Sea through Constanza <laughs> about the, 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 the uh, gas resources that Razvan Nicolescu told us. We have a refinery. I told you we have a nuclear plant. The highway to capital Bucharest is functioning. Uh, so we have all the infrastructure together with the, the Constanza shipyard to ask uh, very good specialists like Mehmet Ogutku, the founder, executive chair of Bosphorus Energy Club. What should we do, Mehmet, with all those billions that are coming to us? Where are the billions? <laughs> in the Black Sea. <laughs> well, I think we shouldn't be that optimistic. Yes, there are not only billions, trillions in the international finance market available for uh, viable projects, but uh, whether they will come or not is another question, because I think this is what we need to discuss as well. How to attract these billions uh, to countries like Romania and cities like uh, Constanta here. Um, but before I think I answer your question, it will be important to understand uh, the broader context, because if you don't understand uh, the game-changing dynamics in world energy and uh, investment and geopolitics, and also regionally what's happening, it's difficult to put Constanta and Romania into this picture. In that sense, uh, I think uh, we shouldn't be that optimistic about the huge infrastructure investments to be uh, considered and uh, constructed uh, as we want because the game has changed in this sense. If you look at the energy picture today, it's considerably different than what we had, let's say, five years ago. Things are uh, evolving rapidly because we used to say, when I used to work in uh, International Energy Agency, that you know, en energy industry needs long lead time. You invest today and the results will be coming in 10 years, 15 years. It's no longer so. I mean, look at the shale gas situation in the US. Who would know that shale gas was going to become a star uh, of the world natural gas industry? And also, who would know that ISMAT was going to emerge as a new gas basin from uh, Tamar, Leviathan, Aphrodite, and uh, uh, Zor, Nur in Egypt? So huge natural gas base was discovered. Again, they are also struggling with the question of how to invest in the infrastructure, how to bring investors so that this gas will be extracted after we establish that there is gas, and then find the most lucrative markets to which you can connect. So it's not an easy job. I mean, yes, Black Sea, uh, we taught that for decades. It may be another North Sea that we saw uh, in the UK, Netherlands, Norway. And, but it failed to fulfill our expectations, except in Romania, because we see that there are new discoveries in Romania, offshore Black Sea. Turkey failed to find uh, much hoped gas in East uh, Black Sea region. Ukraine, because of difficulties, you know, ExxonMobil is pulling out. Uh, the geopolitics are becoming uh, an obstructive force to reckon with in that region. And also, infrastructure investment requires you know, very intense capital commitment. And it takes long lead times, really. And once it matures, its lifetime is 60, 70 years sometimes. And in Europe, if you look around, especially for gas infrastructure, there is really a fatigue for building new pipelines. And uh, so if I always say that, they try to take the decision today for TANAP or TAP, you know, bringing Azeri shot in Stugas to Turkey and to Europe, I don't think that investors will put money behind that. So here, again, another uh, message, timing is very important. <clears throat> when you launch the project, whether it fits into the requirements of the day, and also it's aligned with the uh, trends in the future. Because we are going to, uh, through a transition period uh, in energy uh, worldwide, but also particularly in Europe, more and more moving towards decarbonization or low carbon energy economy. 
And so natural gas will be abundant in certain parts of Europe. Although demand is increasing, we think that by 2030, there will be an additional demand of about, I think, 60 to 70 BCM of gas. This is nothing. Russia can produce this in one year <coughs> in terms of the reserves. So gas is there. But the demand for gas will not be increasing as much as we think it will. And we invested almost $3 trillion since 2004 in renewable energy, wind, photovoltaic uh, power, solar, uh, geothermal, and hydro. And there will be less and less investment in fossil fuels. And the European Union, the widespread feeling is that post-2020, there will be very minimal investment on fossil fuels. So we have to bear in mind also this fact that the decarbonization will be very important in future decisions. Then technologies are developing so fast. I mean, the cost of uh, producing uh, wind energy in Turkey were providing subsidy of about, I think, uh, almost 13 uh, uh, euro, uh, 13 cents per kilowatt hour for 10 years. Now, uh, the cost is coming down to 3, 4 cents. <coughs> and there is not going to be further support coming from government. And how sustainable it will be, we shall see. The projects that already started, they are lucky, but the new projects and will be quite risky. The investors, the bankers will be worried about it. And so I think the technological advances and which will bring, of course, electrical cars to the forefront and bring the cost considerably down in uh, production and uh, will affect the way we take our decisions on energy projects as well as the infrastructure that will uh, carry them. The other uh, important uh, issue is the price volatility. At the end of the day, what consumers are interested, be it government, industry, or household consumers, the price. Yes, for us, decarbonization is important, geopolitics are important, whether you get it from Russia, or you get it from Eastmed, or Caspian, or Black Sea, yes, these are important. But for the end users, at the end of the day, the pricing and the effect on competitiveness is so important. So if now uh, I was in a, a meeting on EastMed last week, and there there was a huge discussion about what will happen to you know, exclusive economic zones, geopolitical tension between Turkey and Israel, Cyprus and uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Israel, all these issues are fine. But at the end of the day, even if you don't have all this geopolitical tension, the cost of extraction and putting into the market of the gas in that region will not make sense because timing is wrong. 2019, you will have Turk Stream at the end of 2019. Turk Stream 1, probably 2, will be coming to Turkey and bringing a substantial amount of almost uh, 32, 33 BCM of gas. And then Shah Deniz gas. Two will be coming to Turkey, 16, uh, six for Turkish market, 10 for Southeast Europe. Then East Med, there is this, uh, I think, pipeline dream that the uh, Israeli Cypriot uh, gas might be joined and put into the pipeline over Crete through Greece to Europe. And uh, it's a huge cost. I don't think anybody will underwrite that. But there is a hope there. And beyond Caspian, there are other producers like Turkmenistan, which have not come into picture. They have the fourth largest reserve uh, in the world in terms of natural gas. But because of the Russian and Iranian obstruction, they cannot cross the Caspian. Only way you can send this gas across Caspian is through perhaps as an email attachment and under the current geopolitical conditions. Therefore, uh, I think you have to bear in mind serious constraints because it's good to be uh, aiming for uh, uh, being a regional hub and uh, I think that's an admirable goal and many countries are doing the same thing when you go to Bulgaria they want to become a hub Greece would like to become a hub or Turkey wants to or be a hub Hungary, Georgia, Hungary, Hungary. Hungary, wherever you go so uh, in my opinion there are a couple of criteria where you can qualify for becoming a hub First, you have to have sufficient production. 
I think in that regard, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Romania passes the uh, threshold because you are self-sufficient almost in gas and oil, traditionally also been there. And you could also bring some transit gas through Romania. So you have the gas uh, base for that. Second is the physical infrastructure and uh, building pipelines, ports, and pumping stations, and what you have. This requires enormous amount of capital, and also trust needed. I need to know that when I build this infrastructure, spending billions of dollars, on the other side of the pipeline, they will require it. Because there is a huge possibility that you build a pipeline, and it will remain idle. Look at Spain, and huge LNG. Uh, capacity they generated, they only use 30% of that. 70% of LNG capacity in Spain is not used. And Turkish-Russian pipelines, you know, we have this Turk stream coming, but what about the blue stream that they built already? It's also underutilized in many ways. And plus, not building any new infrastructure, but you need to upgrade the existing one. And one of the reasons why Russians didn't want the Ukrainian uh, pipeline system, is beyond the political considerations and dispute, is also it is fast aging. It needs to be upgraded. This will require huge investment. Rather than doing this, doing Nord Stream 2 is much better for Russians. So, uh, so you have to see this infrastructure fatigue as well. So it's not easy to convince the bank. I mean, you can decide as government, or you can have wonderful blueprints, visions, but unless it's underwritten by the financiers and the bankers, it's not going to happen. We saw this with Nabucco. More than 10 years we talk about it. And then when the stars were aligned and TANAP pipeline was built like this quite quickly because it made sense commercially at that time. And also I think uh, I like the uh, Schumpeter's uh, phrase that small is beautiful. Don't always think of huge big projects, billions of dollars. Sometimes you need to start in small steps, small practical steps. We are very good at small steps, you can count on us. Well, I think this <laughs> success breeds success. So because big projects, big strategic uh, openings, they are good. It makes good sense, quite sexy. But on the other hand, uh, when you achieve small projects, small steps, and then it leads to bigger, medium-sized steps, and then the bigger steps. <laughs> That's also my experience in the energy world, wherever uh, uh, I went to. And uh, also, I like uh, someone in the previous session said that, you know, the 19th century was the century of empires, then 20th century, the century of uh, nation states, and this century is the century of cities. And it's true. And so we have to give more focus on places like here, Constanta, rather than talking about Romania. Cities make sense, or Istanbul, or Berlin, or Lisbon. And uh, also, I think, human touch, connectivity, not only through infrastructure investments, uh, bringing air, uh, rail, or highways, but human connectivity also makes a big difference. If the mayor is an impressive figure, as he does, you know, takes the plane and flies to Istanbul, and then Sofia, and then uh, Budapest, and Brussels, as he's doing. Also, the best practices he's trying to collect. I think this makes a huge difference. I don't think the mayor is only a facilitator and integrator, as he said. And I like uh, his uh, definition of uh, how he sees his role. But he's also a leader, not coordinator. He's a leader. He has to lead. It makes a huge difference, you know, when somebody believes in what he is doing and leading it to the end. It inspires people, motivates, and it also encourages investors to come when they see that there is a strong will here and people are following it through. And also, uh, our friend uh, from CNN, uh, he talked about the U.S. You know, Google being one of the uh, Stanford University being one of the uh, major investors there. And Israel, startups, when you fail, so that's a success for the next step. I think these are very important messages. Here, uh, I think uh, this city and Romania uh, has greater opportunity to become a hub for technological startups because you have the human capital. You have the connection with the rest of the world. And it will have 
uh, implications. It will have ramifications for the energy industry. When you talk about energy, it's not only you know, oil, gas, petrochemicals, nuclear, renewables, and the energy is in every part of our life. So if you energize societies, and it will have indirect effect on how uh, you develop your uh, energy industry, become a hub. Chinese, I want to say also that they are a new factor to reckon with in this geography, thanks to this uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which links 85 countries, and it involves about uh, $850 billion of investment in energy infrastructure and connectivity per year. I don't think we have seen anything like this in our history. Even the Marshall Aid, after the Second World War, involved uh, 16 times less than what Chinese are offering today. Whether they will be able to manage it, because I don't think Chinese have any uh, experience of managing such uh, cross-country uh, giant projects, because it involves political sensitivities, social issues, and uh, risk, and what you have, they haven't dealt with these issues in the past, but they are learning fast, I guess. But it's a game changer. So if also Constanta uh, could become uh, one of the hubs through which Chinese enter into the European markets, it's not going to be the only one. As you know, the Chinese always work with options, and it takes ages to bring them to any real decision. They can promise the world for you, and lots of MOUs, agreements, protocols, but. Uh, the challenges to bring the real value to the uh, country, I think it will be uh, one of the more beneficial sites because you have to uh, engage as much as possible regionally and internationally. But also there is a fatigue. I mean, there is so much, so many organizations, IFIs, you know, regional organization, Black Sea Cooperation, Energy Charter, uh, Energy Community, uh, so European Union, World Bank, IFC. So there is a web of so many organizations involved. At the end of the day, not much comes out of it. Here, I think, again, smart leadership identifies what really matters, rather than uh, wasting energy on so many different activities, initiatives, be more focused, sharply, and uh, trying to generate results. Because uh, also our friend Mircea said something in his talk, he said, uh, we have to have delivery teams. I like this expression because delivery is what matters. We all look to countries, companies, regions, cities on the basis of what they deliver rather than what they talk about. And so there's more to talk about, but you gave me, thank you, for three hours, but I'll stop here and then perhaps question and answer later. Thank you, Mehmet. We were so optimistic before Mehmet's speech.